it is counterintuitive to say, I only speak about X, Y, Z. This is my brand. This is my, you know, my little wheelhouse. It's counterintuitive. And yet it's the only way people's brains will remember you. If it's like, Lindsay can speak about anything at any time for anything, you're not gonna hire that person. They're not even in your mind. They're not even positioned as an expert. Welcome to Amplify with Jess Ekstrom, a show designed to help women get out of their head and into their zone of influence. Today's guest is someone I feel super lucky to know. For the past 11 years, Lindsay Picardo has been traveling the country, speaking to and working with organizations who are ready to maximize the talent of multiple generations in their workforce. I was so taken by Lindsay's stage presence that I invited her to teach a course at Mic Drop. So you can go to micdropworkshop.com slash series to take Lindsay's dynamite delivery course. Her speaking is incredible and the energy is contagious, but her backstory might be even better. I went into full-time ministry out of college. I got a degree in psychology and public communications. So I've always loved this. Yeah. And I was going to go and translate that into full-time ministry. And I did for several years and there was a couple different moments when I was in ministry where, you know, one time I was pulled aside by HR and I was told like, Hey, Lindsay, there's a rumor that you might be gay. And I was like, oh, how dare they obviously know I, what, where, oh, how, Oh my gosh, the audacity. So I knew, yeah. yeah. And my little, my young career right out of college that, Ooh, this is going to cost me a lot. And so I buried it married a guy, tried to do that for a while. Newsflash, it doesn't work. I literally remember walking down the aisle with my flowers, like, I'm not gay. I'm not gay. Everybody <laughs> look around me because I'm not gay. He's a man. I'm a woman. So then five years oh later, we got a divorce. And, uh, <laughs> and in that time, I was going to coaching school. So coaching school was kind of unraveling my perspective of reality, Mm -hmm. of what's possible. It was kind of getting into my psyche in the best way. It basically won my freedom for me. And after that moment, and after I went through that divorce, I realized, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I could just build my life. I could build it. I don't have to keep everything I already have and be worried that it's never going to come back. And I don't, I don't have to pretend anymore. What if I just really go out and do it? And I had been speaking a little bit. I have a ton of speaking background because I was in ministry, but Mm -hmm. I took all of that, took my research on generations at work, brought in coaching skills that were applicable in the office and creating a speaking business around these concepts. And so, you know, that's how I began my business. That was a decade ago. We've grown 30 to 40% every year, which is super exciting, except the COVID year. (laughs) We broke even, but I'll take it. Yeah, that's um, great. Yeah. And that's just one measure of success. I think a bigger measure of success is my happiness and, you know, my freedom. So your autonomy over it all. And Erin in the comments said she's coming from the same church background. I've heard. Yeah. But well, okay. So you realize, okay, I can start over. I can design the life that I want. Yeah. And speaking is a part of that. What's your step one? Because I know that my step one uh, didn't work out so well. I was just like, let me just email the crap out of anyone that I think might bring in a speaker. And I had no idea what my value was, what my, why they needed to bring me to speak. I just knew that I wanted to get up on stages and start sharing this story. And uh, I emailed so many universities because that's where I was speaking at the time that Gmail like froze my account. They were like, you're done, you're you're banned. (laughs) And that was my moment where I had to reevaluate. I was like, what is a better strategy? And it, it took, you know, this gig where I completely just, I, I stopped acting like what I thought a speaker should be, which I was like, you know, trying to step into that like Ted stage style and, oh yeah, you know, do all oh, the I things, know. share my credentials. And I finally was like, you know what? Here is the real story. Here are the times that I royally messed up and here's how you can avoid doing that. And so when I made it less about me, 
more about them. I then learned what my true value was when I speak in front mm-hmm. of people. At the time, it was speaking to college students because I was a recent graduate and I had started my company in college. That transformation promise that we call it Mic Drop Workshop has evolved over time. Yes. But it, it, it took kissing some frogs before I figured out, you know, where my quote unquote prince was. And I'm curious what your, what your frogs were in the beginning or if you had any. Oh yeah. I got some frogs. Well, I'll tell you <laughs> besides marrying a man. Yeah. Besides going through that. Oh, I'm happily married to a woman just that saying it all worked out, Wonderful. created the life I wanted. So I will say that the piece about confidence is so interesting because when I was in coaching school, I learned a new way to look at confidence that I thought I would share with all of us today. Confidence Please. is the, okay. Confidence in the coaching world is directly related to how sure you are that you'll get this, the outcome that you want. So it could be like, how confident are you driving to the grocery store? You know, how confident is the average person? You might say, oh my gosh, Lens, any day of the week, 100% confident I'm going to arrive. Why? Because you've done it thousands of times. There is no question. Now, remember though, when you were 16 years old <laughs> and you were trying to turn and press the gas and the brake at the right time and how difficult that was to do, just are you confident you can turn a corner? No. Look how much you've grown. And it's simply because of exposure and pressure to accomplish this. And now it's like, I can go to the gro- I can go to any grocery store in the world. I can drive there. It's fine. No big deal. I think of confidence that way with speaking. So sometimes we do outside in like transformation. And sometimes it's helpful to be like power stance. I have this, I can do this. I am worth being on stage. I'm worth being listened to. It's worth doing that. Those, the mental work. And then there's also just getting in there in trying and practicing driving to the store a million times. And I found speaking to be the same way. I happen to have this background in speaking. So my skill set was a little more evolved, which was helpful. But when I started out, I did exactly what you said. I thought, how can I be of service? What can I genuinely give that I'm sure of, that I'm sure if people are there, they will get the result. So I started going to these little coaching groups. They have all different names around the country. But there's probably like a executive coaching group in your city where they meet like every month. And sometimes they look for a special speaker. Okay. Now they might be meeting in the side room of a restaurant and there's 10 of them and they're eating like wings and drinking soda while they listen. That still is a starting point. And that's where I started. I just like, who can I be to serve? Oh, there's 10 businessmen who want to learn about millennials at work. I can go there and just talk through this sheet and tell them the four factors of employee engagement. I can do that. And then I did that. And I'm like, oh, well, I could definitely do it again now that I've done that. And I just stacked, stacked exposure over and over. I also think about it like going to the gym. If you said tomorrow, Lindsay, I I believe you can run a marathon. You can believe it too. I would make it one mile (laughs) and my knee would be killing me. (laughs) This is not happening. But yeah, but if I stacked, and did like couch to 5k. Oh, couch to half marathon. Now I'm going to run a marathon. I could build up to that, but it's time and exposure. And so there's this myth. Yeah. There's a myth when people see you, Jess, that somehow you met the fairy godmother who sprinkled magic dust on you that makes you so incredible and dynamic and successful. But it's really all of those layers, all those exposures over and over again that make you who you are today. Totally. And, and so much of what you were saying, I think back to like a lot of us are speakers and we don't even know it yet. If mm-hmm. you are speaking at work, if you are leading a family, that's if right. you are like, I used to teach fitness classes when I was in college. And I just remember getting like, I would teach a spin class and I remember getting so enthralled by being able that I can say something and it's going to impact their day. And, yes. and so a lot of it, and a lot of people in Mic Drop Workshop, they're like, well, I don't know if I can call myself a speaker yet because I haven't been paid to speak or I haven't given a keynote. Um, I'm a teacher and I'm like, speaking is speaking. And when you do that, you're, you're getting reps with that muscle. But I do want right. to say um, uh, something that I do want to hit on is you know, those reps in the beginning might not be that great. Oh, and 
sometimes, and I, I think, you know, we didn't all step on stage as like Simon Sinek the first time we gave a talk. No. Uh, so I'll share mine if you share yours. Like what was a time yeah. that you felt like, okay, that wasn't my best. It didn't go well. Yeah, uh, I love it. You know, I'm in. Nose goes, you, you go first. Yeah. Oh, dang it. Okay. <laughs> this is so silly, but because I speak about generations at work, I had done all of this research and I like lived in it, like boomer history, Gen X history, millennial history. Gen Z's were just like being born and they were in elementary school. And I was in it so much. And I got up in front of a group of people. It was a de- for me at the time it was decent. It was like 30 people. And I made a comment about how boomers went to world war two. Y'all, they were born after world war two, but in my mind, I had said, I had said Vietnam, but that's not what came out of my mouth. And oh I'm standing there as a generational expert and I just missed something that like the average person knows the answer to. And somebody correct, they raised their hand. They're like, I'm, s- did you say that boomers <laughs> participated in world war two? And I was like, y- what did yes, I did. And this was the time, like you were saying how you're still trying to look yes. perfect, tight, knowledgeable, untouchable. And it bit me in the butt because the rest of the time, I was trying to go through my slide deck and my brain was in fight or flight mode and I was stressed right. and, and embarrassed. It totally derailed you. Yeah. And something like, y'all, boop, I was so excited to be here. I misspoke. Bill, totally. you're right. You know, I couldn't even gather myself to just move along and make a simple yes. mistake. Practice the flub. That's what I like to tell people when we're doing any sort of speaker training is like, they're like, hold on, I messed up that part. Let me go back. Nope. What would you do in the moment if you said this or forgot a line? Because that is speaking. I don't think I've done hundreds of talks and I don't think I've ever gotten off stage and said, you know what? I said exactly what I needed to say when I wanted to say it. No matter how many times you do it. Yes. That's exactly right. And so I think that knowing that being imperfect, messing up is all part of the process. And like you said, Lindsay, it's how you stylize it when you're on stage. Is it comedy? What do you lean to? Uh, I'll say one more thing on this and then I'll tell you my, my flub, but uh, I'm taking um, standup classes right now, which is a whole uh, new experience. Um, I started to do it to see if I could, it could help with some of my speaking and my like humor and timing, but I've just totally, gotten the bug for it. And I have my first, first show on Thursday, which I'm very excited about, but awesome. on one of the first classes, the instructor said, you know, what are you afraid of with stand up? And so everyone had something different and they would raise their hand like, ah, oh, what if there's hecklers? What if I forget what I'm going to say? What if I say something and no one laughs? It's like, great, write about it. So whatever the thing is that you're afraid of, of what could go wrong, write what you would do and how you would react in that moment. Because mm-hmm. then when you have a plan, you're like, okay, what if someone in the middle of my talk is like, this is horseshit or like whatever it is, what would I do? I mean, yeah. that probably won't happen luckily, but what would I do in that moment? And then when yep. you almost have something in your back pocket, then it gives you that sense of calm and that peace of when something is thrown at you, you're like, Hey, this is what it is. Like I used to speak when I was just getting started. Um, when I was like way back in the day, uh, I spoke at a lot of sororities and like phones would go off like alarms all the time. And when an alarm would go off, I would get really frazzled. Like, Oh, there's a sound in the audience. And then I realized that I could turn it into a joke and say, Oh, time to take your birth control. Like anytime (laughs) the phone would go off and it would, it would crush. And so once you learn how to respond and pivot in those moments, um, it makes those things seem less scary, but my flub, uh, was early on and I got asked to speak at this college conference and it was a really big opportunity because there was like other colleges in the audience that could potentially book me to speak. And they said, can you talk about millennials and technology? which I was not like you. I was not a generational expert. Uh, I was speaking about, you know, optimism and headbands Pope. And I was, but of course, in the beginning, you're like, absolutely. I can talk about millennials and technology. It's the thing that I do. Whereas today it's like, 
no, this is the thing I do. And this is the thing that I do well. But at the time you're like, of course. And so I rewrote this whole talk that was just not, um, didn't have me in it anywhere, uh, because I was trying to fit this audience and that was, it didn't go well. I mean, I, in my eyes, it didn't go well. I think, you know, we are always our worst critic, but it also taught me at the end was like, it is okay to say, this is what I do. And this is what I do well. And if it's not what you're looking for, let me find a speaker who does that thing. That's right. Um, which is a turning point because there's a scarcity mindset of like, when you're asked to speak, what if someone doesn't ask again? And you're like, no, if you stick to what you do, then those people will find you. you, Have you had that same experience? Absolutely. It is counterintuitive to say, I only speak about X, Y, Z. This is my brand. This is my, you know, my little wheelhouse. It's counterintuitive. And yet it's the only way people's brains will remember you. If it's like, Lindsay can speak about anything at any time for anything, you're not going to hire that person. They're not even in your mind. They're not even positioned as an expert. I always use this example. It's so dumb, but I was like, if you had a racehorse that needed new little racehorse shoes, horseshoes put on his feet, would you go to like the generalist, like the person that the blacksmith who can do some horseshoes, he can also make other things. Or would you go to the racehorse, horseshoe specialist? fairer. You know, you would go to them and their price might be long. 3X. Yeah, Take but their money. price is yeah. more expensive, Jess, but it's like, yeah, but I know that this will be done right. And I know that this person understands this dynamic of how racehorse shoes need to be put on. Even if they could both do the same exact job, it's our right. brain feels safer with the expert. Well, think about women's shampoos. Like men have one soap <laughs> that they're like, this is shampoo. This is, yeah, like your body wash. This is your conditioner. And you can drink it for all three meals. It is like one thing that <laughs> serves all this purpose. But for women, you go down the shampoo aisle at CVS or Target, and it is every single bottle is scratching a different itch for someone. And the goal yep. is for you to say, like, no, I don't need, you know, a uh, curly texture because I don't have curly hair, but you get to that bottle that says this is for people with straight hair and it will make your hair this. You're like, that is me. That is the thing that I need. And so you want event planners or whoever is booking you to have that same feeling on the shampoo aisle of like, yes. oh, this is the person who is for is solving this problem. And what I see a mistake, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but like a missed opportunity that speakers make is on their website. They list a bunch of topics that are like one word topics, Mm -hmm. like leadership. I speak on leadership. I speak on confidence. I speak on culture. And it's like, you know, I call that being a cheesecake factory speaker. I'm like, no one wants to go somewhere where you like can order like a sushi burritos and like, you know, fettuccine Alfredo, the same restaurant. What's the thing that you do well? And that comes in the form of like one, maybe two signature talks. And when you've been in the business, like as long as we have, that might be three or four talks that you're like, have gotten some reps in, but don't be afraid to pick a lane and say, this is my chef special. This is what I do and what I do really well. That's it. That's exactly right. So if I was just getting started or for anyone in the comments or who's listening, who is just getting started as a speaker, Uh, First, let's maybe talk about the mindset before we talk about like where to find gigs and what opportunities, because I think it starts with just a belief that you have something to say, and that can be tough to do. What advice do you have on just the mindset of around being a speaker? Oh, that's so good. One of the things that I always look for in a speaker is, are they coming on stage nourished and ready to give? Or are they coming on stage asking the audience to give them something? And no one is clear. Like we all have a little ego in it. Okay. Like I understand that part. I under I like when people laugh when I speak. Like that makes me feel good. That's true. And it's the mindset of am I first in a place in my own life where I have the attention, the nourishment, my needs met? Because if you go on stage empty, 
asking the audience to take care of you, it will not turn out well. Audiences are not there to take care of you. You are there to serve them and to guide them. Imagine you and I are going to the Grand Canyon later today because I just love the Grand Canyon and I told you I knew how to hike it. And then when we get there, I'm like, so Jess, should we go down? I'm a little scared. This is, whoa, this is higher than I thought. Should we start there? Or I don't know. Do you think this is a good idea? Like how much would you, enjoy, all of a sudden we, you wouldn't want to be there with me, you know? And you know what I'm saying? And speakers do this where Absolutely. we, we come out and one of the number one things that everybody has to break the habit of is this coming on stage going like this. What's up Indianapolis? How are we all doing tonight? I can't hear you. Oh my gosh. The, the let's try that again. What are we, <laughs> I'm like, please stop. Oh no, 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 no. Please. Here's why. You're asking the audience to deliver something to you. Self-serve. Yes. Oh Help my gosh. Help me feel totally. good about being here. Clap for, like, yeah. give me some shouts. That's not in service to the audience. That's in service to you. There's ways to engage the audience later. Like, raise your hand if you've gone through something difficult in life. That's mm-hmm. so the audience sees everyone else. Not so you go, see, I knew something. Everyone's been through something <laughs> difficult. So it's really... <laughs> Like, am I in a place? And the best way to try this is in little ways, not under a lot of stress, but a little stress. Am I able to show up and serve and mm-hmm. to give and to, you know, fumble through, make mistakes, not to appear perfect? That takes a lot of reps to get there. But that's one piece when I meet new speakers, it's like, what do you want to encourage people about? Give them a structure to think through that might help them and free them in a different way give them a story that inspires them and helps them not feel so alone. What do you want to create in that audience? What are you giving to them as a gift? So I give clarity and levity. That's what I'm giving when I go to an audience. Clarity on what is going on in my life or what is going on in my business? What's the deal with these Gen Zs? Clarity, levity along the way because life is not that serious. So, you know, I'm a speaker. I'm not a neurosurgeon. It's going to be okay. So that's my job. And it's important to get very clear on why you want to do this because it will not, the audience does not give back in the ways that you expect. Totally. Oh my gosh. I want to package that up and replay it anytime (laughs) I'm about to go on stage because the sooner you realize speaking is not about you and it's about them, the better speaker you'll become. And it'll be more fun because when the pressure is off being this perfect human, then your real authentic style of speaking comes out. And so a couple ways, I don't know about you, but um, for me, the tone is set in like the first 30 seconds, you know, and not just the, not just the tone for the audience, but the tone for myself. And I feel that it, when you go out there and you're like, you know, what's up, Indianapolis? Or if you're like, oh, I just want to thank Lisa so much for bringing me. Or like, hey, how's that salmon you guys have on your plate? It's like that 30 seconds is being wasted on yes. just like dead air. Yes. And I always tell uh, uh, speakers and mic dropper, it, it is so uncomfortable the first time you do it, but I promise you it works is when you step up there, first of all, don't talk as you're coming up on stage. Like people get really uncomfortable. Thank you. you. Yes, exactly. Again, it's, it's tone setting. It's just like a nervous energy. Be okay with the applause coming up, waiting till you are standing dead center in the stage. Take that first step. I like to call it a start button, like step, speak, right into a story. And that Brilliant. story should be, why are we here? Like, what was a time that I was a student of the message I'm about to teach you right now? Yep. And that is like, it breaks the ice for you because telling a story is easier than, than telling a, a lesson first. And it also breaks the ice for the audience. And if someone's on their phone, like making their grocery list and Lindsay comes out there and she's like, I remember where I was standing when I realized that I was gay. Or I remember when I was walking down the aisle yes. and realized like I'm I would be like, hold up, wait, yep. what? Which is why you're such an amazing storyteller, because you take people to that moment. And yes. so if you're like thinking about, well, where would I even begin? Like, 
begin with the story of why you got passionate about this topic in the first place. And that yep. will take you so far. That's exactly it. Well, and you know this from, you know, your stand up and time as a speaker that magic comes when you allow there to be tension. You need mm -hmm. to be comfortable with the tension in the room. And oh, I, I smile because one of my favorite parts of a talk is before anything has happened. And now welcome to the stage, Lizzie Bocardo. And I'm just walking out, you know, maybe I'm waving, maybe I'm pulling, nice tattoo or whatever, you know, it all depends. I'm not talking <laughs> at all though, not saying a word, just like, you know, I'm going to come up and I'm going to look at everybody for a minute. And they're like, uh, and you can feel in, in the speaker's mind, it's been an hour. I've gone slow totally. for them. They're like, did I get that recipe? Hold on. They're still getting ready <laughs> to hear from you. And so giving yourself that beat, those moments, that first 30 seconds tells the audience how to interact with you. If I don't mm. joke around in the first 30 seconds, it's kind of strange when I do 30 minutes in. I was like, wait, this was somber. Yeah. Who is she? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're joking. Like it's kind of, so yes, I think that's so smart. I think the other thing that, that you do so well in mic drop workshop is thinking like breaking down the different pieces of what it means to be a speaker. And even for individuals getting very clear on their education, we all need education on how to perform, how to speak and how to write content. So yeah. that is just like being a speaker. That. Yeah. And then getting clear on this other piece of your business development. What do you want mm -hmm. your business development to be? Getting very clear on that piece when you're starting up. You know, sometimes founders, CEOs are like, Linz, I don't want a speaking business. I just want to like be present in the community. And then the third piece is understanding your expertise or your message. And I think when you know all three, the my thought and the way that I've handled it, my philosophy is you bump each one up a little bit at a time. Boom, 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 mm. boom, 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 boom. So, ooh, I, my business needs like some attention. I need to get better with my CRM. I'm going to work, or I need to focus on marketing. I'm losing, you know, people coming to my website. Okay. Or my stories are still so stale. I don't like them. Okay. So mm. let's bump that just by one. You're not going to be a 10 across the board in these three buckets overnight. But I see you do this all the time, Jess. You're just like notching it, notching it, notching it, notching each one of those three areas. That's like that, what I would say to a new speaker. Oh my gosh. One, that is powerful advice. Two, amazing compliment. I just appreciate it so much. And one of the things I love about us and the, like, I guess the culture of speaking is, you know, if someone books me to speak, they're probably not going to book me again for another couple of years. And so it's no, no, you know, skin off my back to be like, actually you should bring Lindsay or you should bring some, this other, you know, amazing speaker. And so to be able to make each other better, not just with mm -hmm. generating business, but showing like what we're doing in our business is really helpful. Um, and I just really appreciate uh, your friendship in that. And it yeah. means a lot. Yeah. That's so, really that's what we're doing. That's how we're all trying to grow a little bit yeah. every day. Um, so to close, well, first of all, do you have a mantra that like before you speak or anything? Oh, well, I have a whole little routine that I okay, love. Let's, cl let's cl close with that. Tell us your routine. Yeah. But I can definitely share a mantra too. Okay. Sometimes I'm speaking at seven in the morning. You know this, Jess. Sometimes you're speaking yes. at nine o'clock at night. Our yeah. circadian rhythm does not play along. Okay. It doesn't care. Yeah. So doesn't care. So I try not to get first thing, say it's, I have a speaking event, a large speaking event on Sunday in Washington, DC. I am not going to get stressed about it on the Tuesday before the Sunday. So one of my mantras is all I'm doing today is talking to Jess, answering some emails, working on this presentation. I'm not speaking today. I, mm -hmm. I can relax and I have to tell my body and my nervous system, like this is not happening today. Don't waste days of nerves on something. You need the energy on Sunday. Don't burn through it now. So that's one thing that's helped me a lot. And it is like a mantra, you know, it's like, man, I'm yes. feeling a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. Yeah. My husband's what like a planner and he'll, it'll be like Monday. He'll be like, oh, what time's your flight on Thursday? And I'm like, nope, nope. We're not doing yep. this right now. Yep. No nope. clue. today. Yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Delta Airlines, seen. we'll figure it out. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And I've seen speakers who, 
have very busy track records. They talk about this too, like pace yourself, focus on today. So um, that's a mantra that I use a lot. When I go, before I go on stage, I do singing warm ups. You can find them all over Spotify. There's TikTok people that are famous for this, but working on my range. Oh my gosh. Because if I go on stage and I haven't done that, the chances of me using my range using to make range. a point, it's not going to happen. Whatever I'm going to use, I got to warm up. Mm-hmm. Um, some people do tongue twisters. I don't know why I can't. I, Peter Piper picked a pick up pickle peppers. Like I'm sure that does help uh, as well. I tend to just warm up my vocal cords and the range of my voice and make sure that my breath, when we get stressed, we tend to tense yes. and only breathe from up here. So really working on taking deep belly breaths. And then before I go on, easy. yes. And then before I go on, Adam Levine from Rune 5 talks about this, but he says, before he goes on stage, he tells himself, everyone out there loves me. Now, I just said a couple minutes ago that that might not be true, but there's no harm in believing it, that you will be well received. So part of like walking up with confidence as I'm getting ready to go is believing like everybody out there loves me and supports me. Mm -hmm. I'm okay because I don't want to come on defensive, apologetic. I need to come on and try to prove. Yeah, exactly. Because people can feel that chip on your shoulder or that tension. So like, am I open and warm and safe? And that's how I know I'm ready to go open, warm, safe. If I am experiencing all of those, which are kind of like emotional, spiritual, kind of strange, they work for me. So those are like the two mantras, open, warm, safe. And if it's not the day of the talk, don't waste your energy getting stressed about it. Oh my gosh, what a way to end. And the two things that I can really work on, I definitely waste or think about like ruminate in something before it happens. So that is amazing advice. Um, Lindsay, where can people find you? Uh, I know right here on LinkedIn. So be sure to shoot Lindsay a follow anywhere else where we can engage with the brilliance that you're putting out there. Oh, that's so thoughtful. I mean, LinkedIn is a great spot. You can always check out my website, uh, just my name, lindsaybocardo.com. If you kind of want to see a lot of what Jess and I are talking about, you'll see kind of playing out on my website. Um, but yeah, that's it. If you have questions or, or you have a question about what we said today, you can always DM me. I'm on LinkedIn. Probably too much, honestly. Probably, probably not <laughs> like that. But yeah. But I just, I'm so glad we got to do this together, me Jess. Too. You're a rock star and people are lucky to learn from you and build their confidence just bit by bit. That's how it works. And we're lucky to have you in our community. Oh, I appreciate it. Well, thanks for being the first and thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll do it again soon. Bye everyone. Sounds great. Thanks for listening to Amplify. If you are a fan of the show, show us some podcast love by giving us a rating and review and give us a follow at Mike Drop Workshop and at Jess Ekstrom. This episode was edited and produced by Earfluence, and I'm Jess Ekstrom, your host. Remember that you deserve the biggest stage, so let's find out how to get you there. I'll see you again soon.